I want to introduce to, uh, someone who has shown leadership over the years. Um, Stephen Lewis is our special guest tonight. Uh, for most people, doesn't need a lot of introduction, but he, Stephen, is the co-founder and co-director of H3 World, an international advocacy organization that works to promote more urgent and more effective global responses to HIV and AIDS. Stephen was the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for HIV and AIDS in Africa from June 2001 until the end of 2006. From 1995 to 1999, uh, Mr. Lewis was Deputy Executive Director of UNICEF and he served as Canada's ambassador to the United Nations from 1984 through 1988. He is currently a distinguished visiting professor at Ryerson University in Toronto, serves on the board as the board chair of the Stephen Lewis Foundation in Canada, uh, is a member of the board of directors of the Clinton Health Access Initiative, and he recently served as commissioner for the Global Commission on HIV and the Law. Stephen Lewis is a companion of the Order of Canada, Canada's highest honor for lifetime achievement. Um, he holds 34 honorary degrees from Canadian universities, and maybe he could give me one, as well as honorary degrees from Dartmouth College and Johns Hopkins University. Stephen Lewis. Sorry to have been inelegant in reaching the podium. I'm, uh, I'm entirely delighted to be here and to join the uh, Harm Reduction Coalition, the International Doctors for Healthy Drug Policies, and the International Center for Science and Drug Policy in this composite uh, omnibus meeting dealing with questions of drugs. I spent a good deal of my time in politics in the opposition, excoriating and slandering the government on every possible occasion, so that I've learned to speak with a certain volume, and I'm not going to be cowed or intimidated by the restlessness around us, and I'm, I'm going to speak for only an hour, an hour and a half, so I want you to become <laughs> relatively comfortable as I approach the subject matter. I, I don't hold the expertise of a number of people in this room, I don't pretend to it, but I want to make some observations about injecting drug use and HIV, and I, I, I want to make some concrete suggestions to you collectively, because there's far too much abstract and amorphous claptrap being uh, used in this, uh, in this conference without specific content. But first, let me make uh, two simple observations. Number one, we've had two significant reports in the last little while that have emerged. The one is the Commission on Drugs, and they did a report, the, the nature of which was the War on Drugs and HIV AIDS. And it is, in fact, a first-rate report in every respect, and to read it and to absorb it gives you a, an excellent sense of what we're dealing with, much of what Chris uh, said this evening in her remarks is embraced by the report and rather than attempting to deal with the statistical compendium, let me simply say that the report is there for you to look at. Then there was also the Commission on HIV and the Law. I was fortunate enough to be a member of the Commission. It has a significant section on drugs calling for decriminalization of personal possession of drugs and calling for a number of astute and knowledgeable recommendations. It's not as good, please don't, please don't uh, report me, it's not as good as the Commission on Drug Policy. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a heroic effort, but it doesn't begin to approximate the first report I mentioned. And since I signed it, I am appropriately uh, I'm appropriately chagrined by having to admit it. Number two, and equally important, you've just had the, you've just had the appointment of Michelle Kazachkin as the Secretary General Special Envoy on HIV AIDS in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Now look, you have a superb advocate. You have someone of courage and of conscience he is no longer at the Global Fund, 
because he's also a decent human being and multilateralism, multilateralism simply doesn't have room for decent human beings. It only has room for barracudas and that is a quality which uh, Michel Kazachkin does not possess. But he is a, he's an extraordinary fellow. He made a speech recently where he used the word homicidal to describe the behavior of those who are attacking injecting drug users. I'm sure there was a cardiac arrest in the United Nations establishment. I can remember once using the word femicide to describe what was happening to the women of the Congo. And, uh, and I, uh, I almost lost my life, let alone my job. Uh, they're very, very sensitive to language. So to have Michelle Kazachkin speaking the truth is a pleasure. Now I want to make some concrete suggestions to you about these issues. I, I think that the speakers who preceded me gave you a sense of what we all know to be true. The war on drugs is an abject and dismal favor, a failure. The punitive, damaging responses to injecting drug users are grotesque and horrendous. The situation in the Russian Federation is beyond the capacity of the mind to absorb a government that is so perfidious and ugly in its behavior to injecting drug use, the, the violations of human rights on every front. And we all know as well, and it's unassailable, irrefutable, it's there, statistically documented, that harm reduction programs work, and they work to the benefit of all, including the entire society. So how the devil do we get there? How do we move things forward? I'm going to suggest eight or nine very, very concrete matters, and, and, and I, I beg you to endure it. I'll speak with almost supernatural rapidity, in order not to offend your sensibilities. Uh, my good friend Julio Montana naturally is sitting down. He knows me, he wouldn't come to a speech standing up. Uh, all right, the first item I want to mention goes back to, uh, to Chris, and that's Hillary Clinton's speech. Now what Chris said about the speech is right, but I, I want to make, I think, a useful point. The Americans have decided on a blueprint it is a blueprint for reaching a, an AIDS-free generation by a blueprint to emerge by December 1st, 2012. It is not a blueprint for the United States alone. It's a blueprint for the world. You, I beg you to understand that when the Americans enshrine a blueprint for PEPFAR, Global Fund, and beyond, it will take hold internationally. That's the way the world works. It may be offensive that one country should have uh, such uh, om omnipotent control, but that's the way the world works. And you can be sure that unless you fight for it, injecting drug users will not be a part of the blueprint which emerges from the United States. They will cover absolutely everything, but they will not cover drugs and harm reduction policy. The only way they will cover it is if we put pressure on them to cover it. There were 65 NGOs who signed that uh, declaration to Hillary Clinton and the State Department saying, give us a blueprint. They got the blueprint. You can see those 65 organizations on the website. For heaven's sake, go to them and tell them that they'll never achieve the end of AIDS if they're going to continue to exclude injecting drug use from the equation. Uh, number two, I want to read you a quote from this uh, commission report, which I've referred to a number of times uh, on drug policy. Quote, with the HIV epidemic continuing to grow among persons who use drugs, the time for national and international leadership is now. Now listen to this next phrase. Within the United Nations system, key organizations, including the Joint United Nations Program on HIV AIDS, UN AIDS, and the World Health Organization, have for too long remained on the sidelines while the war on drugs has fueled the HIV epidemic. Now, rarely do you see that kind of thing in a report, that the sacrosanct, holy UN agencies are confronted with their own delinquency. But again, it is terribly important that the compendium of people here put pressure on UNAIDS and on WHO to do their jobs. And the way you do that 
is to make sure that a friendly country on harm reduction policies and on dealing with the human rights of injecting drug users, that a friendly country raises it at the executive board of UNAIDS and at the World Health Assembly of the World Health Organization. And it doesn't matter whether you go to Australia or New Zealand or Germany or, or France with its new president or, uh, or Portugal, uh, which uh, decriminalized drug possession in small amounts. Find a country and let them put the position forward. There will be a spontaneous and splenetic debate but this is the way you raise the profile of an issue so that it can no longer be excluded from the international agenda. Number three, one of the worst outfits around drugs on the planet is the International Narcotics Control Board. And we're, we're, we're constantly mealy-mouthing our responses to the International Narcotics Control Board. They're supposed to uphold the health and rights of people and instead they embrace the most punitive objectionable, repugnant behavior on the part of a number of countries and we have to stop treating them as though they were some kind of edifice, edifice that should be embraced rather than assaulted. And it's time to speak toughly about the International Narcotics Control Board and what they're doing and that too has to flow from everyone. Number four, the question of the Global Fund. The Global Fund is now in a process of re-evaluation and reconstitution of its operations. Having managed to get rid of Michelle Kazachkin in what can only be described as a putsch, which was largely led by the United States of America, having got rid of Michelle, I'm sorry to speak so, so frankly, in fact, I, I, can't be, I cannot believe the self-discipline I'm imposing on myself. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd really like to tell you about the crypto-fascists who, who occupy so many positions which in fact are of extraordinary influence in the world and put people's lives at risk. I, I mean, it becomes intolerable where at the end of the debate, people lose their lives. And in this instance, the Global Fund is re-examining the content of its work in a way which will suggest that it becomes an organization that works from the top down rather than from the bottom up. And we have to change that. We have to alter it. We have to, we have to make sure again that there are countries on the Global Fund Board which will take enlightened positions around all of the so-called high-risk and vulnerable groups, whether it be injecting drug users or sex workers or men who have sex with men or prison populations, the entire gamut of public responsibility. Number five, it has to be raised at the Human Rights Council. Navi Pile, the International Commissioner on Human Rights, has already shown a willingness to, uh, to take these issues on. A good country should raise it at the Human Rights Council. Number six, I only have 73. Number six, we have to find a way of bringing a resolution to the floor of the General Assembly. That can be done by approaching the President of the General Assembly, or it can be done by finding one or two or three of the friendly countries, whom all of you know, let them draft a resolution about injecting drug use and about harm reduction and about the punitive policies which are, are followed. And then again, you get this extraordinary debate internationally which puts it on the agenda. It's the avoidance of the subject which is so difficult uh, and, the, and, and I'm, I'm proud of my own country because I, I've already mentioned Julio's name, but because of, of the battle that was waged in British Columbia, the Insight Safe Injection Site, the, the, the Insight Safe Injection Site was saved by, and, and uh, Julio would be the first to acknowledge it, by a large constituency of people who work collaboratively. But it shows that you can even get Supreme Court justices on your side if you try hard enough. Number seven, there's something called the G8, the G20, the Commonwealth, the Francophonie. I mean, these are all organizations internationally on whose agenda this should sit. Next year, the G20 is chaired by the Russian Federation. They probably want to put infectious diseases on the agenda. We've got to find a way, possibly through France, to have injecting drug use 
placed on the agenda as part of that overall infectious diseases compendium. And the same with the G8. Indeed, with the G20, there are a number of Latin American countries who would definitely wish to engage in a substantive debate on these issues, and they should, uh, and they should be engaged. And finally, uh, there's the whole question of giving the support to civil society which is required. There are so many of these wonderful organizations that emerge in individual countries and that never have a penny to put together, never have the kind of support rhetorically or substantively internationally that must have it. I work with an organization called AIDS Free World and we, we feel we have a kind of moral obligation to step in wherever there is an exigency, wherever there is a need. And I, and I beg you to consider doing so. Let, 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 let me say, I, I've, uh, I, I'm, I'm hobbling around. I have a slight molecular agist agitation. What's that for describing back pain? I have a slight molecular agitation. Uh, my anatomy is frailer than I wish it would be. So that has communicated itself to my cerebrum and I have used some harsh language for which I will subsequently be regretful. Write that off the agenda. The substance of the debate around injecting drug use, the cosmic decency of people who have a public health problem and a huge right to human rights. I mean, we're, we're fighting it for all that is most noble in the human condition. And if we can move the agenda forward, then I think we can find the avenues that will finally take this issue out of the cloistered seclusion and into the light of day where it belongs and where people's lives can be saved and supported. Thank you.